Well, thanks for taking time, mate, to have this conversation. Um, Pleasure. And, uh, and congrats as well on everything you've been able to achieve in the last, what, year and a half, two years. Um, it's a pretty incredible accomplishment. Oh, yeah, I've enjoyed it, I suppose. Yeah, it's been good. I'm not, I don't think too much about those, the achievements. I think it's all part of a, like we make a plan when you start and just get on it and keep going. And then maybe when you retire, at the end of it all, you're not doing that anymore. You can look back on it, but it's been good fun. We've had good fun. Mm. Yeah. You strike me as um, uh, kind of really very pragmatic and kind of relaxed in your approach. You know, you seem to be able to simplify what other people want to make complicated. Well, I think, um, I just think the game is relatively simple. Hmm. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's, you know, in broad terms, getting the ball up the other end through a whole bunch of other lads, you know, so you got to work out how to do that. And I don't, I think since the game went professional, it's uh, maybe a few people tried to make it a little bit more complicated, so it looked like it was difficult to do, but it's actually not. It's relatively easy. It's, you've just got to love doing it and, and you know, not, not be worried about any of the bits on the side because they're all peripheral. Just enjoy what you're doing. Hmm. When we were talking earlier, you were mentioning about um, being a dad and having, having you know, three boys and a girl. Um, as I was mentioning, we showed a film recently about um, sometimes when boys get raised, they can have a pressure, a certain pressure on them, like to not be like a, a sissy or a wimp or um, you know, certain characteristics that they feel like they can't be. Um, have you, did you like when you grew up, was that, did you feel like that was the case? That there was that pressure to be a certain way? Uh. Well, yeah, obviously there's always the stereotype that comes with growing up in, um, in a, well, I suppose, yeah, in this society where, you know, boys are supposed to be doing one thing and girls are supposed to be doing another. And, you know, often that's, well, that, that is absolutely normal because, you know, we behave a different. Now that I'm a father of boys and girls, I understand that boys and girls are very different. Um, in a different way to what I ever understood before. And that, so it's normal that we'd hang out together and, but it's probably more around, you know, what's deemed acceptable to say or think or do, perhaps when you're a teenager in particular, I think that sort of heat comes on. And you gotta get through that. We gotta try and get through that with a clear picture of you know, who you are around those types of issues, you know, when it comes to the more, I suppose, the more delicate side of life, that you can have a voice if you think somewhere. I, I read once that you talked about um, rugby players aren't robots, and, you, you know, you talked about the need for people to kind of be themselves, you know, like how do you, how do you think that, like, relates to kind of men today, you know? Well, for, for rugby players, it's, it's a strange thing because, you know, you're told you've got a specific role to complete in the game and, uh, and you have to do that. So, uh, but we also want them to have the chari a character, you know what I mean? You want a team made up of different type of characters, you know, lovers and fighters and jokers and hard men, quiet types, bookworms. You, you want to have that. That's what makes a great team, you know. Um, uh, how that applies to uh, men in general in society, like, hell, I'm no expert, you know, I'm just one, one man in the middle, but I think one of the big things, pe men are under, like all people, but men in particular in this instance, are under a lot of pressure to, from media, social media, TV, uh, the, this sort of image that everyone's supposed to, maintain and um, perhaps it's about finding the reasons why you want to have or be a certain way and, and beliefs behind that that are re the real key as opposed to just doing it because someone else tells you that that's a cool thing to do. Because yeah. you, um, 
you also strike me as someone that kind of backs yourself, you know, like you're not afraid to be just who you are, like unapologetically in a certain way. And um, where do you think that kind of came from? In, you know, when you talk about beliefs and... Uh, maybe from my own dad, you know, he's... The, they picked up, he picked up and left his country with nothing, you know what I mean, to come and have a crack at a new life and um, in Australia. So that's pretty bold back then, you know, and uh, I think that uh, one of the, like, I just think that self-belief is a really important thing, you know, that you are who you are and there's no, you don't have to apologise that because nobody's perfect. So, yeah, if, if, if I've got many imperfections, that's for sure, but that's who I am, you know, and I, as long as I'm a good person for the values that I have, and that's, that's pretty much all that counts, you know. It sounds like you, um, it's like you've got a strong, like, internal compass, you know, that what other people are saying, what other people are doing, it's not really helpful to be kind of listening to that in particularly in the role that you're in you just say I think that's true? you've got to you've got to always I've always listened to others to be better you know mm. I'll, continual improvement is 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 important you know I, that I'm always getting advice from different people along the way and some is valuable and some some is not but just the the mindset to say oh well you know I need to keep growing I need to have that growth mindset where I can move my own opinion etc based on some uh, underpinned by I suppose some core beliefs that I have about the game or about you know uh, my own values or whatever that um, you've got to keep adding and evolving and changing you know what I mean as opinions have changed so many things that we took for granted before we thought were absolutely normal and now change totally. Whether, you know, like, uh, uh, I would never have thought that my, you know, kids will get up me because I haven't got my seatbelt on, you know what I mean? That just comes from education or, you know, we're all putting unleaded petrol in our cars. So the, the things change and you've got to be open to change as well. You know, you don't have to be set in your ways and just see that. So. Yes, you've got to listen to people and get advice, but you've also got to make good decisions about the direction you're going. So it's a fine balance of keeping the two in check. When you talk about things changing, um, I, I heard that you, um, I think it was last year, you sent your players to NIDA to do some kind of some team building. Mm, no, that was this year. Yeah, this year? Yeah. I mean, mm. like, I don't know, things changing like 10 years ago or something, I don't know. Do you think that would have been looked upon as a little kind of like what are you sending rugby players to theatre school you know like that's a I think it's a real shift in in where people are at and where players and culture is at do you think I look I it's hard for me to remember what the stuff that we used to do like we didn't do any of that stuff I, I think uh, it's almost infectious that idea that uh, this is okay to do. Sometimes people just need a bit of guidance and say, this is cool, like this is funny. Um, or, you know, I'm outside my comfort zone here, but I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable being there. And it just broadens your horizons a little bit, you know, and you know, we had a bit of fun down there. We did a bit of team building. The, the lads had to, they had to make a, uh, a music video, I think we asked them to, but I didn't tell them that the next day they'd have to perform it in front of all the NIDA students, you know, that were coming in <laughs> and having a laugh. And they were, they were really good, the guys, you know. They, and it's, you know, that's not going to win us any football games, you know, <laughs> like, but I'm a, I'm a big believer in better people, better players, you know, and uh, because they've got skills already, they just got to be, better people will become better players just by nature. It's mm. always been my experience. Yeah. Do you think that's a shift in, in something around men though too, in, in being able to do that? Like, do you think, like my suspicion is that would have been harder in the past for men to do that. There would have been a sense of like, you know, sissies kind of act or that's for other, other kind of people. Yeah, look, obviously there's always the stereotyping of, you know, what, what we 
should be like, you know what I mean? And then before, uh, the generation before ours even more, you know? I suppose that the more knowledge we have, uh, the more ability you, the, the more ability you have to believe because sometimes we have ideas that we may not believe in fully. Like this is, I feel like this wash, and then you, right now we have the ability to tap into different sources to say, oh, hang on, there's someone else thinks like that as well, and another person thinks like that. And so this is actually not weird, you know? And, um, and then you start to have your beliefs a bit, you, you're probably a bit stronger in those, you can, because you're feeling a bit of backup, really. Mm -hmm. And I think that that change is just, it just happens naturally. And it usually stems from one person then affecting another person who affects another person, you know? Mm. And I think uh, there's still, obviously still a lot of stereotyping today, but um, perhaps almost a little different version of it in, in different ways in the old days of, you know, uh, drinking stubbies by the barbecue and your thongs and, you know, like all the guys hanging together and all the girls inside making salad or that, that's changed, you know, but even then there's even different stereotypes now where balance is, is something that's becoming probably um, the new most cool where you can, it, you don't have to go to one extreme or the other extreme. It's about having that balance in the middle where you can sort of live a little bit in both worlds. Mm. I can imagine with you, you know, like you're at one level in a kind of highly competitive, kind of passionate um, role, and then you go home to be like a dad and a husband. Um, how do you find that, that kind of transitioning between those two worlds in a way? Mm. It's not always easy because sometimes you take it home with you, you can't help it because the truth, truth be told is that, you know, Coaching rugby is not a job, you know, it's like a, it's a passion. You do be doing it anyway, even if a game, if you weren't getting paid for it, there's lots of guys doing it, coaching rugby that aren't getting paid for it. So, so you take it home, it's inevitable. You, you can't leave it just at work. So, but, you know, there is a lot of, um, you know, I often find myself very contradicted in what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, what I'm telling lads to do in the game and in their practice and in their, in their mentality. And then when I go home and, and have to switch over into another domain around kids and, um, and what they're looking for as well. Hmm. I noticed this morning when I arrived here, you know, just was walking around, how many I don't usually get up this early and come around these kind of areas, but um, how many men were taking their sons to like daycare or whatever it might be and holding their hands and walking them to their daycare, you know, and I just thought, geez, it's a different, it's a different world, you know, from even when I grew up that that just wasn't the case. Even, even the holding of a hand, of a young boy's hand, you know, there's something yeah. different in that, you know. Like, well, I don't think, uh, what, what, what I suppose the, the big thing is you're asking a little bit or trying to get to is, should men be showing their emotions, you know what I mean? Because you want to hold your kid's hand, you don't not, like, um, and uh, the, I suppose men are getting more comfortable in doing that, you know, I've, I've got no issue with that, you know, um, at all, you know, in fact, I get dirty if they don't want to hold my hand, you know what I mean? <laughs> mm. <laughs> What's wrong with you? You want to go and, uh, go and run off over there or you say come and give me a cuddle and he just brushes me and go over to the TV you know or something like that so the I think uh, that we're definitely I know for me where on a day-to-day -day basis I'm asking chaps to knock lumps out of each other you know and it's pretty aggressive and the rugby is a game of intimidation so you you're always on the edge there to going home and then having, you know, being gentle. I know yesterday, just yesterday, we, we went out training. It was very physical. You know, I was quite, you know, loud at training and, you know, giving a lot of instructions. And it just happened, obviously, the kids are on holidays. And my wife decided to bring the kids to training. So as I'm walking off the field, 
transitioning out of that head, I've got to go straight into, uh, you know, the attitude that I would have looking out for my kids in front of all the players too, obviously. Which, you know, I think that uh, the guys really like. They see that you can, you know, it's almost like you, you, you can be wielding an axe one minute and then pushing a pram the next. And that you've got the belief and the, that both things are, are okay to do. I think that's the, you know, really, it's you know, hearing you talk about that. I think it's the, it's the like the final piece in a way. I think for men, you know, like I think they've got the, the head sorted. You know, they've got the guts and the spine kind of sorted. And then if we can bring in that heart, you know, that caring dimension as well, you've got like a whole man, you know, who's kind of happy with himself and relaxed, and also can perform well, you know, because he's not shoving down certain feelings or feeling like I can't show that in front of another bunch of other blokes, you know? Yeah, I think um, uh, with um, some of the guys that I've coached in the past and we've got, uh, we've gone a bit deeper than just the rugby stuff. We do a lot of mental preparation and, you know, just to get the team talking honestly in front of each other about, you know, things that are not even rugby related. And what that does is when you do talk honestly in front of your teammates about things that are personal to you, all of a sudden everyone gets respect. They get to know the person they're playing with a little bit more and you respect them and you'll take the time to look out for them. And we've done a lot of things. I've done, I've been involved in a lot of things where um, it, it, you can see the players uh, changing you know into i suppose not, not not necessarily more caring but just more understanding more compassionate almost or they can have empathy but they can also be hard it's it's a really f fine line in rugby because sometimes you've got to tell guys as it is you know which is tough but then you've also got to be compassionate or empathize with their situations uh, not everyone's got the same situation off the field as well so if you can get, like you were saying, that perfect storm almost brewing where you're feeling very content, then you, you're much liable, you, you, you're definitely liable to perform a lot better. Mm. We had um, Paul Roos come and speak at an event for us uh, last year and it was a business conference and like around leadership and it was really interesting to hear he basically spoke a whole bunch around compassion and the role of actually having a caring kind of culture in a team. You know, I know you've often referred to feeling like you're part of a family. How do you, what do you do in your team to actually, you know, have that kind of that sense, you know, within a, within a team get created? Well, you have to, you have to be honest, number one, all the time. Mm -hmm. So honesty is very important, whether it's positive honesty or in negative, you know, and People respect that. That's often happening. You know, we always see the the 15 guys on the field, but there's another 15 or 20 that aren't playing. Um, but you it, you also create the bonds by people knowing who are uh, who their teammates are, where they come from, what how they got here, wh where the, who what their parents are doing, how did their how did their parents meet, where's the, st the story here, and you know. I know um, with we, uh, with one of the teams that I've been involved with recently, the you know every player, anyone that's new or every player comes in and does their family tree, and the, the other players look at that, you know, and they can see how they explain it, you know, so you can see start to see what's important to to someone straight away, and family's a very important part of what we're doing because when we go home straight after the game the person we want most to give us um, uh, support or e uh, either support if we lose or uh, a rap if we win or want to see happy and a smile is our closest you know mm -hmm. our wife or girlfriend or mother or father kids you know what I mean sometimes kids aren't so uh, they don't quite understand at a certain age of result. So when you get beat and you go home and the, the, the kid, your kid says to you, ah, oh, you lost today, <laughs> like what's, you know, you don't get that, uh, that sense, but you want to make them feel, you want to make them feel proud of you. And that's very, um, family's very important. Hmm. 
Mm. You, um, you know, another another kind of example, I guess, of of what you're talking about was, um, and you just you're just even having this conversation, I noticed that it strikes me just talking to the you know the the coach of the Wallabies and the Waratahs and. Um, I don't know, for me, I get, I get personally kind of touched in a way when I hear you talking about this, these kind of honest conversations and people really showing who they are and, and we talk about kind of hugging your boys and, and, you know, and your girl, obviously. Um, we had a, a, another couple of, uh, last year, we had another couple of CEOs who came in and, and shared in a, in, a, in a forum just really about difficult times that they'd been through. You know, and a lot of them talked about like you know, depression and anxiety and all these kind of things. And you could nearly you could hear a pin drop at the end of this at the end of this session. You know, because people weren't used to hearing three men in suits who were CEOs kind of share like that. You know, um, and it sounds like when in your in your culture, you know, that when other men hear other men sharing about what's really going on for them, it creates a certain bond. Would that be yeah. that be right? Yeah, well, uh, I think in uh, one, one of the the things that is one, oh, I don't know, I suppose one of the biggest casualties of modern times seems to be the truth. You know what I mean? Like, we're, everyone's sprouting a message or trying to con you into some type of uh, 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 situation by almost a bit of subterfuge or there's always a little spin at the back of it or there's always a kicker in the end you know this so that happens so often you know what I mean instead of just genuine honest talk you know and I it's I think it's very much appreciated honesty mm. and um, the if yeah rugby's a game of skill and <clears throat> and power and all that type of stuff but at the end of the day uh, the great victories are, are won by teams that are prepared to, you know, put their body on the line for each other genuinely. So the next guy really wants to make the, the sacrifices required for the guy next to him because he genuinely respects him and, mm. and, uh, and wants to do that for him. But you can't fake that. Mm. So the only way you get it is by creating that type of environment. Mm. You, know, you, you mentioned the... Um um, you know, kind of doing everything you can to for your for your teammates, and then at the other hand, I've heard you say, "I'm not afraid of losing," and you know, you said, if, "If I don't win, it doesn't mean I'm a worse person." I think it's a really interesting way of kind of approaching something because it's, it's clearly clear you're passionate about what you're doing, and yet, on the other hand, you've got this other relationship to winning and losing. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I, I've learnt over time, I suppose, with experience that, you know, if I'm, if I just set out winning as a goal, then I'm just being like everybody else because everyone else wants to win too. Uh, so if we're all targeting the same thing, it's a toss of a coin, you know what I mean? You've got to, you've got to target something else, um, a, a different type of a certain quality in the planning, the preparation, how the people that you're asking to do things respond to your requests, the improvement of their preparation and their understanding as to why they're playing their game, mm. or what's the what is the why? Why are they what's their motivation? Tapping into that as well, preparing it in in the most you know, perfect manner that you can, and then that's it. That's why I say game, like game day for me is day off. That's the whole, that's your day off in the week. So, because you've done everything, then it's just sit back and enjoy and, you know, and sometimes it doesn't work out. But that's, that just helps you enjoy the good times more because you'll feel the bad times. It's when you become indifferent to the, the outcome that you haven't invested in the, the journey to get to the outcome. Mm. Do you think that affects, you know, I know a lot of people talk about presence and being in the moment. Do you think that kind of after you've done all your preparation, letting go of that helps you to actually 
be in the moment? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Like everyone, that everyone talks in. It's always laugh, you know. I mean, everyone talks about pressure and this. Like we're just playing a game. Like you know, there's some people with serious issues, like outside in the real world, where you know there's people starving in Africa and there's people on the poverty line here in our own country and in different places. People can't get a job. There's people who are really struggling. There's massive drought out on the land. Uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. So when people talk about pressure in rugby, they make me laugh, you know what I mean? It's just a game. But it's a very powerful game because it's not often you can get 60 or 70,000 people in the one place having a good time. Mm. And that being, being able to get people to enjoy themselves and have um, that many people, you know, together without being a protest or something, you know, bad, uh, having a good time all on the same page, you know, supporting the same thing is a very powerful, uh, it's a very powerful thing. And, and uh, that's a responsibility that we, our, our players understand. Like a lot of people's, you put, you have the opportunity to put a smile on a lot of people's faces. That's a really powerful thing. Hmm. Also, you know, I mean, I, I really get how people can kind of see you at one level, you know, as, as the coach of a, of a team, you know, from a performance point of view. But, you know, to actually, I was just thinking about this the other night, to actually hold together a group of people, no matter who they are, you know, whether they're players or not, you know, there's a real, um, it's a real skill and shows the quality of someone to be able to do that, you know, like that would be a big part of your job, right? Holding, creating that that atmosphere and that feeling in a group of people. Yeah. Well, I think it's about setting <clears throat> a set of beliefs out very clearly that everyone wants to identify with. Very clear identity of who we are and what, what, how we play, what we stand for. And not just holding the players in there, but all the staff and all the supporters. You know, we, we have a really clear identity piece uh, say at the Waratahs where I coach uh, at that we we can only judge <laughs> we judge our success by how much our supporters after a game if you went and asked them <clears throat> what they thought of the game they would they would be able to give you the characteristics of our identity piece just from watching the game mm. and um, and that's uh, I think that's important to be part of a movement you know, as opposed to just, you know, in a, in a rugby team playing a game. Hmm. And going back to, you know, you were talking earlier about, you know, upbringings and, um, you know, your own <coughs> story. And you mentioned your dad. Um, and given this podcast is kind of focused around men and caring, you know, was there, was it your dad or your mum? Who was the person, do you think, in your, in your early years that really taught you that, that caring is like a strength? you know, and, and it's a really positive thing? I think it's a combination of both, you know, like you, you, only, you only need one perfect parent, but you generally need two parents to make up that one perfect one because they've got different qualities and you put them together and they, you know, and that's why uh, when people who are single parents does do such a magnificent job, you know, because they have to embody all those qualities in their one person. You know, and um, uh, I was pretty lucky in the fact that my dad had a certain set of qualities and my mum's that sort of together gave me a bit of every, like gave you just gave me just the right sprinkle of everything around, you know, when to be tough, when to be um, a bit softer, you know, when not to moan, you know, and, and when it was all right to have a whinge, you know, or... Uh, when to make your feelings known and when perhaps not to, what was the right thing to do. And it's, yeah, it's, it's funny, you know, with that, um, <clears throat> those things, you don't realise that they've, when you're being brought up, you probably don't realise that they've be, that they're in you, you know, and it, sometimes it takes certain events or certain things to start to identify that you actually have those qualities inside, you know, the ones that are caring or the compassion or 
that type of um, looking after someone in a difficult situation or we, you don't realise that <clears throat> sometimes until a situation appears that requires you to bring it out. When your dad passed, you know, what, what did you kind of learn from that and whether it changed you? Oh, <clears throat> I, th I think it, um, it, yeah, I suppose uh, I was the, the stronger one in my family, I suppose, around that time. I don't know why, it just sort of turned out that way and tried to give as much support as I could to the other members of my family. I was obviously really sad. And, but it was funny because I went out, I, probably a month or two later, I went on a trip somewhere. I ended up in Hong Kong, what was transiting, I think, overnight. And I was just in the hotel room by myself. And I reckon I cried for about six hours, like, just, you know, you just realise it at that time. You maybe haven't had the chance. It's so funny how you're uh, somewhere in all of you, the inside of you, your emotions or whatever, you actually, almost it's almost like a, a tank, you know what I mean? You know you can't take any more at a certain time and it all comes out or it's empty and you need to replenish it or it's, it's strange how it works out like that. But um, I, I, like I was saying, I think he always gave me a really good clear guide to life and how it should be lived. And, and, um, and like I said, it's my opportunity now that he's gone to you know, give back some of that experience that he gave me. Were there like moments or things that you guys like to do that your dad would like to do with you that would sh was his way of showing you that he really cared about you? Yeah. yeah, like he was always doing stuff, you know what I mean? For, you know, his own things or whatever, but he was religious about taking me to play rugby, you know, like always. And, you know, my dad wouldn't have been the, hard, wouldn't have been the hardest chap around, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think he ever played rugby or, well, they definitely, because they're from Lebanon, he, there's certainly no rugby there. It's, um, he, he'd always tell me, like, he, he knew he'd played the game for a hundred years. He'd tell me what I did wrong and what I did right. Oh, what I did right. You know, he was probably my harshest critic around playing the game, but he was always there, always at the game, always, took me when I was little or came to watch when I was uh, playing when I was older and you know he really you really felt that support you know what I mean. You talked earlier about um, the tank you know when the tank's empty full and and you know you're doing a hell of a lot of stuff you know like you know with your family and the Waratahs and the Wallabies you know what do you what do you do to kind of take care of yourself you know to make sure that tank is full you know. Or at least, um, at least over halfway. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we have a lot of fun. Like, we don't take ourselves too seriously. You know, it's like I said to you before. It's, it's just footy. You know, so a lot of times, we're always taking the Mickey. You know, or having a laugh, or we'll do something in the media that you know is an absolute joke. Everyone thinks it's serious, or we'll you know one day we'll come down to training, or what with the you know we're always doing video prep or something like that, and we'll. Yeah, put on some crazy music video or ask the chaps to do karaoke or you know, we're just always doing crazy stuff to have a laugh and I don't know, in a, yeah, keep balance, you know, it's not, we don't want it to be serious, we want, we want to be really great um, in our preparation but we also want to enjoy that preparation so same for coaches, we want to have a laugh and do crazy stuff and um, uh, you know, get moves and do things that we would, you know, could be risky in the game, but let, like, let's just do it anyway, see what happens. And, um, and we're always arguing and trying to see who's got the best idea to get, you know, things into the game. But, uh, and then, you know, on the, away from the game, take the opportunity to sit down and relax. And it's not much, there, there wouldn't be much time at the moment for doing, getting away from it obviously but we know that until um we know that the next six months you know from a family point of view is going to be like that i'm getting you know unbelievable support from my wife and uh and i want to just make it enjoyable for her as well and for them you know whenever i can the um 
you remind me when you talk about not taking things too seriously. We've done some stuff with the Dalai Lama, and um, I think what so many people really like about him you know, is that he's he's like always laughing, you know, and yet he's got a pretty serious kind of message, and yet he's delivering it in a way that, you know, he's, he's not taking the whole thing seriously, you know, and. Do you think that also affects like performance and people being able to do their best? You know, well, like? Look, when we go, uh, I know it's not always up there with the sports scientists these days or the trainers, but we love going hill running, you know what I mean? Because even though it may not be the best way to get you fit, it looks just damn hard, you know? But as we get the guys run up the hill, we're telling them, you've got to run up with a smile on your face. It's <laughs> actually obligatory, you know what I mean? I don't care if you... If, uh, if you're faking it or whatever, but you must run up with a smile on your face. It's quite funny, you know, we're yeah. taking the pictures of the guys and stuff like that. But that's the way we should be doing it, you know what I mean? We should be doing, enjoying what we've got. Like, you, you want to give a lot of thanks for the situation that we're in because, uh, you know, you, you're able to play the game you love and will be involved in that and, you know, okay, yeah, you're lucky getting paid for it too. And, hmm. It's a golden opportunity, you know, there's people out there doing really hard jobs and, hmm. you know, you just got to give thanks when that, when that, for the situation that we're in and make the most of it too. Hmm. I was thinking when you were talking about, you, you know, with your dad and your dad passing and you're going to Hong Kong, this morning when I woke up, just had this thought I hadn't thought about for years and it was when my cousins came to visit me and one of them was homesick because she'd never been away from home and, and, and she was crying. In, she was staying in my bedroom and my mum came in and I, I was probably like seven or eight, you know, and my mum said to her, like, it's okay to cry, like, because it's healthy to cry. And I remember as a, as a young boy just hearing that, there was something that kind of switched in me to go, all oh, right, I'm allowed to cry, you know, because for some reason I thought I wasn't meant to cry, you know, as a, as a, as a young boy, you know, there's always that kind of be a man kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think, do you think like your boys and such, do you think they're growing up in that environment where they, they're free to kind of share how well, they're feeling and stuff? In their own family situations, they're all a little bit different, I suppose, you know. Um, I, I think that our guys are learning to share a bit more because we're putting them in the situations where we're asking them to, you know. So as part of their own development I think that there's the reasons that we do do that is because back in the day uh, rugby players would have also been working and having jobs where they're uh, and put being put in situations where they're exposed to having to deal with the, some of the brutalities of daily life and, and you know having to, to deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis Whereas nowadays, it's a professional game, obviously, so all they're doing is rugby. And sometimes that can isolate them a little bit from what's actually happening out in the real world. Cause it is, like I said to you, it's not like it's a, a, a job, or it's not like it's a job, it's not like it's some, something people are doing, going to uni to study and then coming out and getting a degree in that and then going and practicing for the rest of their lives, it's short term. So we want to give them the situ put them in the situations where they're having to grow their life skills as well, you know what I mean? Which I think is only normal. Yeah. And um, the more that they can get comfortable with expressing themselves um, at all levels, the better they're going to be at playing rugby, you know? And I think that because, yeah, okay, I wanted them to improve and everything, but at the end of the day, I want to, my goal is to have a rugby team operating like, uh, as slick as possible. So you know, all those little bits around the outside to create uh, players and people who can deal with all different types of situations, the, the more chance we are of being able to cover you know, anything that comes across us in game time. And if you were, you know, just in kind of conclusion, a couple of questions around, um, if you were asked like, what's the, what are your measures on, on on a kind of real man in a modern era, what would your kind of measures be? Um, well, I, I, I've, I've got to be honest in saying that I don't have any expectation of what a man should be. I think 
that the only thing a man should be is true to what he believes. You know what I mean? So if he believes something and that that's who he is, then he should be that person. And he shouldn't be someone else because he read it in a magazine or he saw it on a TV show or he saw it on a music video even, you know what I mean? Or in a video game. Uh, and uh, that's, that's what I think they should be is true to themselves and that can be anything, you know. Um, but true to themselves and b believe, show who they are and what they believe. That's awesome. And what about um, success? If you, if you were kind of say like your personal definition of success, you know, there's a whole bunch of kind of crazy ideas out there about what it means to be successful in life. You know, what would you, what, what's your definition of, um, of that? I think it's, it, it's just about uh, if you say you're going to do something, then do it. So um, if you say every day when I wake up I'm going to clean the house and you do that every day, then you're a success. You know, so many people say things and then just never get around to doing it or never do it. Mm. You know, and it's just the small things. You don't have to be mega star or it's certainly not related to money, that's for sure, because there's many failures who are very rich. Right? Um, it's just about if you say you're going to do something, then do it. Mm. Pretty simple for me. And the. Um one of the things that's really important to the, the work that we do is, is, is around the theme of kindness. And uh, we're always interested to know, I'm mean, interested to know with you, who's, who's probably been the kindest person that you've known in your life? Would there be someone that pops to your mind as that oh, was the my, person? Your mum? My, my mum before I was married and then my wife after that, you know? Hmm. I think that's absolutely normal thing for, you know? You're born from your mother, you know, so, and uh, they look after you at, at all costs, from feeding you from the start and then looking after you. And, you know, and then from there, obviously, you transition in your life and you meet um, uh, uh, a partner who then looks after you as well. Not, and I don't mean that in the way of makes you dinner and, you know, uh, irons your clothes, I mean, looks after you emotionally and looks after you from a support point of view, respects what you've got to say and um, uh, takes you for all your imperfections, you know, and, um, and I, you know, that, that, that's often, I've known in life, that's often can be a battle sometimes too between mother and partner or whatever, but as long as you've got, you understand that order, it's a, it's a perfect order. It's a normal order, you know what I mean. I think mm. so. But so many people have been also have been kind to me in different ways as well along the way. So it's hard just to say, um, oh yeah, that person there or that person there. But um, well, I think that the the key thing there is that kindness is such a uh, it's it's such an important part because it teaches you to be kind as well. When someone is kind to you, it also teaches you how to be kind to others too. Yeah, the, the Dalai Lama, when he was asked about his religion, he said, he said that kindness is my religion. Well, that was it, you know, like... Um, well, it really is, isn't it? You know what I mean? Like, it's how you treat others and no matter what faith you're a part of, how you treat others is pretty much the example of the, the manifestation of uh, faith in actions, pragmatic actions, isn't it? So, you know, I think that he's obviously got it worked out. Uh, that's why he's the boss. <laughs> so, um, you know, if it's good for him, it's definitely good for everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Look, I just want to um, thank you for your time today, Michael. It's, um, you're the first cab off the rank, you know, when it comes to the, these men in these series of conversations and just hearing you talk openly about, you know, your emotions and your feelings and the importance of care and your teamwork, all those kind of things and um, really kind of means a lot. We want to thank you for that and uh, also wish you the best of luck, you know, with the, the rest of the season and the World Cup, um, big things and just really want to um, wish you the best.
Thank you. Cheers, mate.